Good evening, New York State Library community, and welcome to the New York State Trustee Handbook Book Club. I'm Brian Hildreth, your moderator for the evening. It's wonderful to have all of you present for what is now our eighth installment of the book club. Tonight, we'll discuss planning and evaluation, which is covered in pages 59 through 61 of the handbook. As all of you now know, planning is one of nine trustee responsibilities, and evaluation of a plan's goals and objectives allows the library and community to realize and celebrate life-changing accomplishments. Both topics go hand in hand and will provide a nice evening of learning and growing together. The purpose of the New York State Trustee Handbook Book Club is to provide explanations and insights for more than 6,000 library trustees in New York State. Each book club session takes a deeper dive into one chapter of the trustee handbook and answers real life questions received from the field that arise in the areas of governance work for library boards. Before we begin, let's get quickly acquainted with our learning environments. If you take a look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button and a chat button. I'll reference the Q&A feature shortly, but for now, I'd like each of you to introduce yourself to your colleagues by placing your name, your library, and how long you've been a trustee in the chat box. And I'll say that one more time for those of you that are just jumping on. Please share your name, your library, and how long you've been a trustee in the chat box. As all of you say hello, I'm going to introduce two of our planning team members. The first individual is Casey Conlin, Mid-Hudson Library Systems Sustainability Coordinator. In addition to helping us prepare for all book club installments, Casey is online with us tonight to help you troubleshoot any technical issues, as well as help us with managing the chat box. The second person is my co-moderator, Ron Kursop, and one of our presenters for the evening. Ron has extensive experience and knowledge in, the, in library planning, so we're grateful he'll join Rebecca and Jerry to walk us through the planning and evaluation process. Ron will also moderate our next month's installment, which discusses public relations and advocacy. Now, let's take a moment to give thanks to our co-promotional sponsors. It's these organizations that continually support libraries and work tirelessly to advance our greater mission for the benefit of all people. Thank you to the New York State Library, the Public Library System Directors Organization, the Library Trustees Association, and the Public Library Section of the New York Library Association. We take comfort in knowing these institutions remain steadfast on our behalf. This evening, we're discussing planning and evaluation of the trustee handbook. As mentioned before, planning and evaluation are part of the nine trustee responsibilities. They're also one of my favorite activities of the handbook because they empower trustees to connect with their community face to face and use their creativity and inspiration in partnership with director and staff to deliver meaningful community focused impacts. In the moments ahead, we'll chisel out 90 minutes to receive an overview of the topic from the handbook's authors, Rebecca and Jerry, as well as Ron Kursop. They'll also provide answers to frequently asked questions, which were sent in advance by our viewers. Following that, I'll moderate the open Q&A by those of you who are attending the live session. When you have questions for Rebecca, Jerry, or Ron, please place them in the Q&A area by selecting the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This is the best place for all questions because it'll allow me to organize them in the same order that they are received. If you have general comments you'd like to share with your colleagues, like, can you share a link to that resource just mentioned? Or, it is so good to be here with everyone please feel free to put those comments in the chat area by selecting the chat button at the bottom of your screen. I'm confident we'll receive as many questions this month as we've had in early installments. All questions are important and the more questions, the better. As a reminder, planning team members have been curating all past book discussions content on our website, www.midhudson.org forward slash trustee book club. Library trustees can take comfort in knowing these resources are available through this website. Now, let's briefly introduce Rebecca and Jerry. Rebecca Smith-Aldrich is the Executive Director of Mid-Hudson Library System, along with co-authoring the Handbook for Library Trustees of New York State. She's also authored the Companion Handbook for New Library Directors in New York State, and the Municipal Ballot How-To Guide, as well as two books from ALA Editions. Jerry has distinguished, distinguished himself as a leader in the public library services as a director, a system director, and a library educator. He's also considered one of New York State's most authoritative experts in library management, finance, law, and construction. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Rebecca and Jerry and have them kick us off the most current installment of the Trustee Handbook Book Club. How's it going, guys? 
Great. Pretty good, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So I'm excited tonight as well, just as Brian is, that we're doing planning and evaluation. Um, I spent 20 years of my career before becoming the executive director here at Mid-Hudson as a library consultant, doing a lot of work on planning with library boards, not only in my own system, but across actually the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, I uh, really enjoyed it because I have to say almost every single time I was asked to help a board with it, and we do our initial meeting and talk about the process like we're gonna do here tonight, at the end of the meeting, folks would be like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. Are you sure we have to do all of that? Like, I don't know if I wanna do that. And I'd, I'd assure them it was gonna be a good experience and they were really gonna appreciate it at the end. And I have to say every single time, every board I ever worked with on this topic, and I have to admit I've kind of lost count at this point, at the end, they would all come to me and say, that was great. That was some of the best time I've spent on this board. And part of the reason is because the work that you put into it is one of those times where you truly see the dividends of your return. You'll definitely get insights into your community. You'll get guidance and compass settings basically for decisions that you need to make at the board table. So once you make it through the process, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's some work for sure. We're going to explain that tonight. But once you do it, all of a sudden things start to fall into place decisions get easier to make. All of a sudden you understand you know, what to say about the budget and why we're spending money over here. When the director comes to you with a, a proposal of maybe changing up the staffing patterns, you understand where they're coming from because you understand that you're all on the same page about what you're trying to accomplish on behalf of the community. And so all of a sudden everything starts to flow from the work that you do in the planning process, from budgeting to personnel, to facility planning, to outreach efforts in the community. And you can really see it start to just start to click. And and good things start to happen and you just start to build momentum. And it's truly how you start to get that investment and that love back from the community when they see you working on things that are responsive and relevant to their lives and the things they need uh, to be successful as an individual, as a family, as a neighborhood. It just really is the, the key ingredient to, I think, a great experience on your board is having a well done long range plan, strategic plan and operational plans that help you get to those goals um, that you identify through talking to the community. So wow. you may have noticed, oh, Jerry, go ahead. No, I said, wow, you're great. Uh, but I did want to say, this is what you're here for, folks. And if you ever got on a library board and wondered what, what is my job, this will define your job. So you'll notice in the minimum standards for public libraries, the new ones that came out, there was a key phrase that was added to uh, the minimum standard for long range planning. And I fully admit to uh, advocating for this while I was on the committee that helped to redo the minimum standards because this is the key to it all. I know there's steps and we got some questions from folks you know, thinking that because we emphasize the idea of a plan being community-based, it might mean that we're disrespecting staff and board input, and that is not the case at all. Um, and we'll explain that in detail for you here tonight. But the idea of a community-based long-range plan means that as, John, as Jerry said before, that you actually got out there and spoke to the folks that you represent while you're on the board and have a better sense of what their hope hopes and dreams are for the future of the community and their, their lives, so that when you design and authorize library services and programs, they actually speak to what folks are interested in and trying to accomplish in the community. So it's not just that we don't think that it's a good idea to be in an echo chamber at the board table or, or with your staff and think that you know best. Sometimes I have to say board and staff probably could have written almost the same plan even without talking to the community. We have to stop being so literal about this, uh, this issue. You're involving your community in your process to build support for the library long term. The process that we propose and we'll cover here this evening is literally designed to help you build support for your library to win your votes at the polls and to help more people walk through the doors of your library. So it's not just the literal translation of I talked to this person and I produced a plan. You're working on a much bigger systemic issue that you're dealing with long term for your library by uh, implementing some of the best practices that we share in the trustee handbook. 
So this is the part that I truly love to do in the planning process. Uh, and we'll be talking about some techniques you can use. There's certainly no one way to go about it, but we've certainly got track record of success uh, for a number of uh, libraries in the state using a particular process we'll share here tonight. But this is the one, one of my favorite stories, and I, I know she's not on the call tonight, so I feel free to talk about her. I'll just use her first name. It was Janet at the Saugerties Public Library, who once they got engaged in this planning process, she got so excited about doing the interviews with the community and the focus groups we were doing. She literally didn't want to stop. We had to have an intervention. You have to stop eventually and collate the information and move forward with your planning on it. And she kept saying to me, but this has been so much fun. I've met so many nice people. I understand what they want now. And it really just was driven home to her that it shouldn't be something that we're protective against. We should invite that uh, input, that idea building and co-create the future of our libraries alongside the members of our community that we're here to serve. So Jerry, I think we are uh, going to switch here now to more practical stuff, not just pontification, and talking about the, the different types of plans. This, we thought this was something really important to be clear about up front because it causes a lot of confusion as we talk about planning in general. Well, it is so much fun to be uh, on, a, on a show with people that are so engaged, enthusiastic, excited, and experienced, because I know we're going to not just hear from you tonight, but other some of your colleagues, but um, what Rebecca just said was critical. Bottom line is you're a public library. You belong to the public. So it's your job to listen to them. So let me move ahead. Uh, this is, um, the, Rebecca, let me talk on this because she knows my favorite thing is talking about library missions. And I do really enjoy uh, using Simon Sinek's uh, why, how, and what, uh, and I will start with, first of all, there's a lot of confusion as to terms we use in planning. And I'm gonna just say, it doesn't matter. Uh, the long range plan, the strategic plan, the operational plan, they do tie in very nicely with this why, how, and what. Uh, so I, I'm gonna start with that. First of all, if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. So the why issue deals with what your mission, vision, and values are. And the first step in all of your planning, if you haven't done it already, and I know that at least half the libraries of the state of New York have not fulfilled their obligation under minimum standards to do their planning, even though you might say you have, uh, it, you need as a board to really talk about why are you here? What is your mission? What is the purpose of your library? This is how we started our very first program uh, on this handbook book club, book club. Why are you here? You need to have that kind of conversation. And that's the beginning of your long range planning process, which we'll get into the details later. Strategically is, you know, okay, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to get there? How are we going to fulfill these wonderful dreams we have? And they're not just your dreams, they're the community's dreams. Why does the library exist? Why are you there? What is the future of your community? And your library is critical to the future of, the, of your community. And then how you're gonna do it or what you're gonna do to get to, to, get to there is, is another, you know, another part of the process. But to, to, to be very practical, as a former system director, I was required to have a five-year plan for the state. Um, we had to do it, and let's be honest, it looked great. We filled in the blanks, and within a year, it became almost meaningless. So what was incredible, in absolutely essential was that we had a strategic planning process annually. Okay, what are we gonna do to fulfill these wonderful goals that we've established for the state? What, you know, give us a few things that we're going to accomplish and then how are we going to do that what are the actual things that we're going to do so no matter what words you use the process is simply state your vision make sure that it fits with the, the values of your library understand what the mission of your library is and what libraries are in general and then start to detail how you're going to get there and then the detail, and then obviously of what are you going to do to get to, to, to fill all that in, the, 
the actual details, the activities are another set of, of, uh, of lists of projects of things you're going to agree on. Now, what's nice about this, and, and this is a, another a, a personal approach, is that the annual strategic process, filling it to, to, to fulfill the long range goals, the whys, does fit into the whole concept of evaluating not only how the institution is doing, but how the board is doing and how the director is doing. And you can tie this all into a cyclical nature that really makes sense. And I think that's our, our next slide. Right. Before we move on there, Jerry, I just wanted to, to share this. Yeah. I really like the, the hierarchy of this, of, you know, because I find boards sometimes get really uptight as they, they hear these big plans that the community would like help right. with. And we start to think about how our library is going to help with these things. And the next thing you know, we're talking about, we got to expand the library. And then we're off doing a facility plan, but we never finished doing the larger kind of 30,000 level planning uh, goal. So I think this progression of let's first focus on the big things we want to try to accomplish. And then what are some of the key things that have to happen to make that possible? And then when you actually operationalize it and recognize there might be a gap between where you are today and where you need to get to in order to be successful in that strategic and long range plan you've developed, then you can get into the nitty gritty stuff. And I find that a lot of boards wanna jump right to the nitty gritty stuff without agreeing on why we're here and what we're trying to accomplish. So I like this hierarchy that we've, we've created in the, the handbook. And it's just kind of by chance that it matched up with the golden circle, which should mean we're on the right path with this. <laughs> I love that, that you use the term dream because libraries were a dream. They're a, an, you know, an institution of optimism about it, making the, the world better tomorrow. So you've all heard about it, uh, the planning cycle. And uh, I, I think what our purpose tonight is to get you to relax. It's gonna be fine, enjoy it. It's fun if you institutionalize it and don't think it's an enormous uh, project. It's something that you can, the first time you do it is going to be difficult. You're gonna to have to wrap your arms around it and get it done. But then it gets easier as time goes on. And this thing about observing what's going on and questioning and making a plan and doing something about it and reflecting, i.e. evaluating, and then going through that process again is something that every library should be doing every year and perhaps every month at the very least as a board, when you get together. How are we doing? Uh, they, Ed Koch used to be a, a mayor of New York, was very popular at the time, and he'd stop people on the street. He says, how am I doing? Well, how are you doing? And it's not a bad question to ask. And you might not like the answer from time to time. And actually, if you don't, how you respond to that will determine how well you succeed in the future. So. We don't believe in a, a five-year you know, planning process. We believe in having goals, uh, dreams, visions, values, and going through this process on a continuous basis. And I, again, I, I mentioned this, this ties into the evaluation of how the institution is doing, how you're doing as a board, how the director is doing. And uh, so I, we, we urge you to not be afraid of this. Uh, and, and in recognition, historically, library literature has provided enormously complex planning processes. Um, and thanks to Ron and, uh, and, and uh, his colleague, uh, who's now the state, library, uh, state librarian, uh, Lauren, we have a very simple one that we have in our handbook and we have that's reflected on the state develop, the library development uh, page. Rebecca? So in the trustee handbook and the appendices, you find the simple planning process outline. It's, it's five steps, which of course are way more involved in the paper that it's written on. But we wanted to invite Ron Kirstoff, who's the executive director of the Pioneer Library System and one of our 
uh, co-conspirators here in planning the trustee handbook book club to join us in perhaps a different role tonight. You're probably familiar with Ron as a moderator of the session, but we're inviting Ron to help us with the presentation and Q&A sessions this evening because he has a lot of experience in planning and help to really streamline the planning process so it's much more scalable for libraries of all sizes. I grew up in uh, the profession learning at the uh, knee of Sandra Nelson, who wrote the new planning for results a book, uh, which is part of the results series from the Public Library Association. Association. I had to go to two weeks of training to learn it, and it definitely has shaped my view of how we do things. But I have a lot of smaller libraries in my system, and if I handed them that book, they would literally run away from me. Um, so finding ways to make this planning process approachable and doable by libraries of all sizes is one of our goals in the trustee handbook. So Ron's going to walk us through these steps and explain them a little more than what you see, perhaps, uh, on page 112 of the handbook. So Ron, thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I graduated from, uh, for at least for this session, to be able to hang out with you guys. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Uh, so, yes, uh, I've learned a lot about planning over the past few years, and um, I work with a lot of smaller libraries, and the planning for results model, uh, while you can get a lot of information out of it, it is a very, it's an, in, it's an involved process, and sometimes uh, smaller libraries or even library, medium or large libraries may not be able to, to invest that type of energy energy into it. So the process that you see on the slide right now doesn't necessarily it's not uh, it's not it's it's a formula that you can add various uh, activities to as you go through. But as Rebecca said at the top, think about your planning process, not as just you're gathering information to create a plan, but truly this is an advertising campaign for the library to get more involved with the community. Uh, I've had uh, boards use it as trustee recruitment too, as they're going around talking with various people and getting people interested in the library. And it's, and it's also a better way just to understand your library. So you know what's going on in your community as a trustee. The first, uh, point on this slide develop a board vision so this one uh it's 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 described as a simple process but it there's there's a lot of layers to it and rarely is it one conversation but the way that i look at this one is it's having a conversation outside the normal business meeting uh and when you're discussing as rebecca and jerry said the hopes and dreams of your library figuring out really what does that library look like several years out in the future, 10 years in the future, this is what we want it to become. And it's an opportunity to assess where the trustees and the directors are thinking to make sure that at least some of the areas that they are that they would like to work on are aligned. Now, you're not going to write a 10-year plan, but it's a good idea to know what direction you're heading in. And one of those first steps is to make sure that everybody has kind of a rough idea of where you're going. The next step in this one is assess the library. This is looking at all the internal information that you can pull together, together and it helps you understand how the library functions. It could be usage trends, um, and keep in mind that you don't wanna to focus too heavily on one trend over another. I know libraries like to look at circulation. In some areas, there's concern about a decrease in circulation, but that's okay because maybe your programs are increasing. Maybe the technology aspect of your library is becoming more prevalent in your community. All of these areas are things that you want to look at to see how is our library currently impacting our community? What are the people looking for that you are able to provide really well? What are people looking for that you may not be able to provide as well? Really asking yourself these questions and figuring out the way that we exist now, how is it impacting that community? What I like to do at this phase is basically set a hypothesis for what I'd like to see included in the community to see how well it lines up with what the library uh, staff, the board, the trustees, and then the community all come together on to see if this assessment can really reflect what the community is looking at too. And when we can come together and we can have our early assessment and then the community input, once we put that together, if we get kind of similar outcomes, I'm feeling pretty good about the, uh, the planning process. Another way to assess is look at libraries of similar sizes, budgets, populations, things like that. The next item, number three, and it's bolded here because as Rebecca said earlier, this is uh, probably arguably the most intensive and important piece of the entire planning process, uh, which is finding out what the community is thinking. And uh, 
in, in a little bit, we'll be discussing the, the libraries transforming communities. Um, but the big thing that I want to mention right now is that you want to remember that libraries, uh, I like to encourage my libraries to avoid asking people, what do you want from the library? A better question is usually revolves around that community member or the individual to figure out exactly what it is that they do within the community. What are their goals? What are their aspirations? What are they looking forward to doing in the next few years? Because if you ask somebody, what do you want the library to do? They'll say more books, more programs, more, more, more. But that isn't necessarily the strategic objective of the library. You can't just grow uh, indefinitely and be all things within the community. You want to have that strategic momentum, and you do that by talking with people and figure out exactly what they need within the community. As you're talking to people, you'll start to understand how they exist in the community. Why do they love that community? What brought them there? And extrapolating that information out to figure out what are the objectives, the long-term goals, the projects that you want to put into place, those are going to be what helps you develop that final plan. After you've gone through uh, gathering your community input, you're going to want to analyze everything that you've learned. Most of the time when you're gathering input, you'll probably have a plethora of different exercises. Um, I've used focus groups, surveys, uh, interviews, um, talking with friends groups, talking with community members, all kinds of different stuff. And you're going to get this whole pile of information. When you're analyzing that and you're looking at everything you've collected, there's a few different methods that you can use to look through that. The one mentioned in the trustee handbook is a really great one, the SOAR method, and that's analyzing your strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and the ultimate results of what you're trying to get out of it. And those will help you determine what you need to focus on as an organization. Once you've looked at everything and you have some ideas, then you're assessing what, what's the library's capacity in a, very, in a variety of different areas. In the handbook, it talks about personnel, finance, facility, policies, partnerships, governance, uh, public relations, and then ultimately your evaluation of it too, and trying to figure out how are we going to measure this. So how can we take all this information, figure out how we can benefit the community within our, us as an organization, and then eventually evaluating that to see how well we did. So put it all together, you have a plan, and then you evaluate it, and you keep an eye on it as you're moving forward. And that's the simple planning process kind of outlined real quickly. So Rebecca and Jerry, if you have other things that you want to add to that, I'd love to hear it. You did a great job on a very tough topic there, Ron. Thank you so much for doing that. I know you do an awesome job, so thank you. Uh, I can't add to it. I think you did an awesome job. I think the outline that you find on page 112 in the handbook, it it reinforces a lot of what you heard Ron just described. So if you're like, oh, I, I didn't write all that down. You, literally, it's in the handbook already. <laughs> so you can read about it. Uh, your system, your public library system usually has staff um, that are pretty experienced in planning and can help you facilitate some of this uh, work that you're doing. And if not, there's other consultants out and about in the state that can help you do the work as well if it's a little too big for your library board. Um, your director should be intimately involved in the process. Um, and something that we're gonna talk about, I think a little later, when when Brian joins us is how to make sure we're all on the same page about your process. So as we said, this is one way you can approach it. You might have folks on your board with other experience with strategic planning that might have some other ideas for how to do things, but we all have to agree on the process that we're going to use and the timeline that we're going to use it on. So I wanted to just share this resource that has become really critical in our system, in the Mid-Hudson Library System. We were early adopters of the American Library Association's Libraries Transforming Communities program. And Casey's actually gonna share the link in the chat box to the resources they've developed that are all free for libraries across the country um, to use on the gathering community input phase of the planning process we've presented to you here this evening. And there's a lot of different resources on there. This is my favorite, and I think for good reason, because we've seen such success with it in our system. More than 30 of my libraries have used this process and we're gonna invite Casey to join us to talk a little later about how we use this and, and the results that we're getting. But when we think about what are we asking the community for, Ron made the good point that when you ask folks about the library, uh, what do you want from the library, they'll say more of what they already love about the library. And that's because they're not library experts. 
they're experts at living their lives and uh, making the people around them happy and, and going about their business. We are the library experts, library staff and director and boards. We live and breathe libraries. We understand what we're capable of, the kinds of results we can produce, the capacity of our staff, uh, how to leverage the staff and other assets that we have in the library for the benefit of the community. But we have to understand what the benefit is the community is trying to get out of the library. So by for 20 years, I learned to ask people about what they want from the library and this has totally turned it on its head which is to ask the community what kind of community do you want to live in why is that important to you how is that different from how you see things now and what are some of the things that need to happen to create that kind of change will the library services and programs be the answers to everything that you gather through this process absolutely not but it's going to help you identify themes that emerge from interviews and focus groups using the structure with these questions that help you understand understand the larger values of your community and how the library is going to fit into those values and leverage your assets to help people achieve in these areas. So a little later, we're going to, as I said, invite Casey to, to share a little bit about the process we've used here at Mid-Hudson. But I just wanted to embolden you, empower you to think about using this instead of defaulting to the age-old surveys. We uh, love to just kind of put on the front desk about, do you like our hours? And uh, don't you love Miss Julie, our, our children's person? Because of course the answer is yes. <laughs> Of course they love it. Of course they want more of the wonderful things that you do. But are those wonderful things that you're doing actually making a difference? And I think that's what the planning process can help you do is identify those areas of work that are necessary for collaborative and collective action in your community and help you understand how to position the library through either direct services, partnerships, outreach, or passing along information to the right people in your community to do work in areas that are being identified by the people you speak with as needing attention. So I'll just uh, briefly share that we've used this uh, program, as I said, more than 30 times with our libraries, and we've seen municipal leaders take part in it. It's a great excuse to talk to the mayor, the supervisor, the fire chief, the police chief, uh, clergy in the community, well-connected folks that know what's going on. Super great excuse to invite them to the table and talk about something that doesn't cost any money, um, but is actually just getting their expertise into your planning process. And this goes back to what Ron was saying before about so suddenly folks will get excited like, oh, you're going to work on that? Like, I never realized the library did work like this. And you're very smug because you're like, yes, of course we did. But it goes back to the whole idea that this is actually a promotional activity that you're doing, not just a planning activity. So strategically involving folks that are opinion leaders, elected officials, uh, heads of agencies that really make a difference in your community in your process it might seem at the outset like you're co-opting their great ideas, but they have a wide view of what's going on in the community, more so than people at your board table might or your staff might. They're gonna help you tap into ideas and resources from segments of your community that don't currently use the library. And that's really key to something we said early on in this series, is that your library is for everyone, not just the folks that currently walk through your door. So this is a great excuse to get out to talk to non-users, community leaders, and do so in a structured way with a facilitation guide that's already been written for you. So it truly is a DIY approach to planning with really high-end results that normally you couldn't have gotten without a consultant being involved before this program was put together. Ron, did you want to add anything on this one? Yeah, I, I will say that um, I brought this to boards and um, they have uh, scoffed at it a little bit to say that, uh, well, we're, we, need, we need to ask about the library. It's the library's plan. And if you think that when you bring this to your board, that may be a response that you get, it, it may be. And usually what I do to kind of dispel that is I ask the board these questions and see how much they start talking about all these various things. And then they start to, from their own personal aspects or the other organizations that they're involved with, they start to talk about what's important to them or how it's different from they see things now. And then by the end of that meeting, they're like, oh yeah, it looks like we are coming together and having this conversation. So I think the best evidence of this tool is just to use it and you'll see how well it starts to get people talking and also you can use this uh, as Rebecca said in in focus groups you can have this as a one-on-one -on -one conversation with people there's a it's very flexible in terms of how you implement this too so you know, this is just the step three of five, but we wanted to just share this with you in case you're looking for a solution to how you'll go about in doing this part of your planning process. We obviously are big fans of it, but certainly other approaches out there. There's no one way to do this work. 
So we wanted to bring it back around to evaluation, which no one likes to talk about. We always just like to say, ah, it looks like it's fine. Looks like we're doing great. Um, but occasionally metrics are helpful and measurement uh, can be helpful, right? Those things that are going to get measured get done in many cases. So when we think about how are you evaluating this and doing so in a way that doesn't become overwhelming for the staff and the director and yourselves on the board, there's a couple of just key best practices that we found that, that work really, really well. So this is probably for our director series we were just talking about before uh, this meeting started here this evening, but directors often will structure their reports to the board in a way that matches with the goals of the plan to make sure they're regularly reporting on progress in those areas for those goals that they're directly influencing. Sometimes the goals are uh, board directed, board needs to do some work on things, but often they're service related and your director is gonna be reporting on those routinely. You'll also want to integrate your goal structure for the year into your board committee goals. If your board has committees, which I hope they do, uh, can really expedite a lot of the work of the board. So sometimes committees just meet because they always meet, but what if they actually had purpose and direction and were doing things that were actually advancing the plan? So, so there's sometimes things that your committee might need to work on to uh, at that operational level of planning to make sure the policies you need are in place or the investigations necessary on your funding or your facilities are happening. So it's not all on the director's shoulders. This is why we have a board, uh, is to advise on this work and, and sometimes do some of the research that's necessary to get us to the next stage of evolution for our libraries to meet the needs of our communities. And then we recommend uh, three check-ins throughout the year. The top of the year, where we're all in agreement of the plan and the goals for this particular year of the plan, a mid-year check-in to say, hey, how's it going? Do we need to make some adjustments? And we're, we're here to tell you, you can make adjustments to the plan. Just because you decided on something two years ago, like maybe before a pandemic, and then you're in the middle of a pandemic, it might be a good idea to give yourself the license to adjust things to better meet the needs of the community and to uh, face the realities that your staff is contending and operating under. And then end of the year to just reflect back, how did it go? How do we do? Do we need to make further adjustments for the coming year? Do we have to acknowledge maybe we don't have all the cash we need to do everything we hoped we would? And do we need to change the operational plan in order to effectualize and actually realize the goals in our long range plan? And so just adjust as necessary. This is a, a working document as uh, Jerry alluded to uh, earlier in the evening. A lot of times these plans get done, they get filed, we check the box on the annual report, and then we just keep doing the stuff we've always been doing. But if you wanna actually get some use out of the work you put into the process, I think you wanna embed it in your reporting process, your committee work, uh, board meeting structure, and really make it a living document that is producing results on behalf of the community. The other thing we wanted to share with you is project outcome, because there's certainly the board side of how you make your plan actually work for you and produce good results. There's also the service level evaluation of your plan, not just the governance level evaluation of your plan. So something that the director and the staff may want to consider as they start looking at your strategic and operational goals. When we're thinking about programs and services that are being delivered to the public, how do we know they're actually having the results we hoped they would? Uh, sometimes we look at attendance numbers, but that's not necessarily the answer. That's an output for sure, but not a value statement on the experience people are having through those services and programs. Project Outcome is a free resource from the Public Library Association at projectoutcome.org that provides you with outcome-based evaluations for, I believe it's seven different service areas that you may be producing services and programs in. So you can use it to ask patrons to fill out a quick little survey to tell us, is this actually making a difference for you or your family? And it gives you fantastic data when you're able to say to a legislator or the voting populace that 100% of parents that come to our early literacy program agree their kid is better prepared for school. That is solid gold when we start talking about why libraries matter and why we need further investment in libraries in the future. So sometimes you do need the stats, but you also need the stories. So making sure staff have methodologies to collect those things to report out not only to the board, but through your annual report to the community when you're doing advocacy work, which we're going to talk about next month. This is one of the tools in the arsenal of libraries to produce uh, results and proof of those results at the end of the day. Jerry, I see you leaning in. Do you have other thoughts on this one? I'm just, I'm just uh, constantly inspired by, uh, by your work, Rebecca. Keep it up. I'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
All right. So evaluation is a, a probably maybe a whole topic unto itself, probably better suited for the director audience, uh, for folks that are here with us tonight. But on the left side of this screen, I think is for a governance board, what you want to make sure is happening that you see uh, on a regular basis. So I'm going to close down the slides uh, here for now and invite Brian back on the screen to help us work through some of the questions that were submitted and so we can handle the questions that are uh, coming in live here this evening. Hey, nice work, guys. And I just want to share uh, something that was written in the chat while you were sharing your information. And it comes from Anna. Anna says, I love all this. And I'm going to say I completely agree with Anna. I was right there with her throughout the whole time where you guys were talking because I'm equally excited about planning and evaluation. It's something that we do here at our system and work with our member libraries on. And it's so important to the work that we do because it just makes certain that we're delivering on those community impacts that all of our community members deserve from all of us. Um, so I'm ready to jump into questions. If you guys are, uh, we've got some really good questions that were submitted uh, from participants leading up to this evening. And then just before we get started, I just want to remind folks to click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to start submitting questions. We've got nine questions already in the, in the queue, so uh, we want to make sure that we get uh, to those a little bit later in the session. So the first question uh, that's asked is, are there any ground rules a board should establish before planning? The last board I was on, not a library, went in two very different directions on what the plan should accomplish. In the end, we gave up on the exercise and no plan was created. There were hurt feelings. So where do we start? Well, I'll start quickly because Rebecca's got some solid suggestions on that. If you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. And having a process, as we've outlined, gives you an agenda and it gives you a process. But starting with what are the mission, what's the mission, vision, values of the library is going to help in, inform that process tremendously. And the board's got to buy into it. I mean, if they're not, if they haven't gone through the process of why we're here, then they don't know why we're doing this. And there, it's true, and Rebecca mentioned this before, many of our boards, most of our boards have people with varied backgrounds who have done this before, they're involved in many other organizations, and they go off in a lot of different ways to do things. So it would be important to agree on the process and at the same time, really take some time out to discuss why you're here and what the mission is. I actually think like a purpose statement for the process might be helpful because I think going back to that slide that talked about long range plan versus strategic versus operational, we need to have folks sight line at the right level. Um, and we mm -hmm. all need to be on that same sight line as we get as we get started because you might have misaligned expectations. Uh, you might have some folks at the table who think, well, once we're done with this, we'll have a facility, a master plan for our facility. And other people are like, oh no, we're gonna have these you know major goals about how we're gonna contribute to student success and and uh, change the world when it comes to community engagement in our neighborhoods. And then other people are thinking about, well, I think we need to start helping the staff um, figure out how they're going to build capacity to do work as technology changes. So I think that conversation at the outset is so critical to make sure we're all doing planning at the right level um, and understand how some of those things are nested within other aspects of planning. And I just want to second uh, Jerry's point about agreeing on your process of who's involved. Are you going to have a planning team that's made up of staff and trustees? I would hope so. Uh, and are you going to do this on a particular timeline so folks know when to expect to hear back from people on that team that are doing some of this work? That's the other problem I've seen emerge. Uh, yeah, we're doing planning this year and the director is going to make it happen. And then people keep asking the director what's going on and they're like, look, <laughs> You didn't give me any help. You didn't tell me when you want it done by. If we could all just agree on that at the outset, I think things go much, much smoother. One other comment uh, that at least I've seen quite often is a board will start up this long range planning, this planning process. And they'll say, they'll, they'll grab on one or two issues. Oh, we need to expand the library. Oh, we need to change the legal structure of the library, which is something that Rebecca and I are very involved in. And they go off on that project. They fall in love with a major institutional changing process, you know, project without fulfilling the rest of the whole picture. Uh, get through the, this process first. And if one of your major goals is to assure the financial and legal stability of your institution, 
Well, that's great. That's great. And we can help you. Uh, uh, but the, uh, the, the, the same thing is true with buildings. Uh, they fall, people fall in love with the building projects. And don't we all? But let's get this long range strategic institutional process in place because you're going to use that year in and year in and year in for decades ahead. Once you get used to it, it's not a problem. But finish it and then go do the big jobs that you have set out for yourself. Thank you. So the next question is, our board meets the requirement of a long-term plan, but it extends eight years and was adopted in 2016. It's broad with little action and it doesn't seem applicable to a post COVID world. Any advice for how we get the full board to work on a plan that covers less years with more actions? Um, so I'm assuming that they're talking about a uh, minimum standard requirement of a plan. They have a long-term plan, but uh, you know, how do they get something with more action? So maybe along the lines of strategic planning? Joseph Stalin didn't even do eight years. Uh, now's the time to, now's a great time to redefine the future of your library. And it, it's your job as a trustee. Now, I know, again, Rebecca's got really practical ways to, to look at this, but the fact of the matter is, is that all of your plan, this plan is something that needs to be evaluated, as we just said, almost on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis. And uh, if the trustees don't want to do it, they're, they're missing out on one of the most fun parts of their job. Rebecca? I think most people would agree that COVID changed the landscape. So you know, if you had a plan that was from you know 2016, it was already aging before the pandemic even hit. And then when the pandemic hit, it certainly accelerated changes and the need to take a closer look at what the community is dealing with and how the library fits into the landscape of the community in the aftermath on the ongoing math, whatever it's called at this point of the pandemic. So I think that that is a great excuse and most reasonable people at the board table would agree, yeah, we've got to recalibrate that plan. We need to be more responsive and relevant to people's lives today and figure out what it looks like to move forward from there. Um, I also would caution against like eight, 10 year plans anymore. I think, you know, when I, I think when I got started, we, I was seeing those 10 to 20 year plans looking out, which were magical to me. Like I couldn't, I couldn't figure out like, how do they know? Like, that's amazing. Like, what are you looking at? What, where's your crystal ball? Um, so I think we've seen an evolution of shorter cycled plans over the past few years. It went down to five years being the standard. Then we're seeing three year plans but that are tightly controlled on an annual basis. Um, so I think that's more the average that we're seeing now. I'll say three to five to be generous. I think it's skewing more towards the three. Um, so I think also just giving yourselves the permission to get into that continuous improvement mindset that planning gives you. Uh, once you go through the, the big process and then you iterate on that in the coming years, as you see things changing and adjusting and you improve the position of the library, new and more ex exciting things are possible as you build up uh, using the, I think, the foundation that planning process gives you. And also in that question, so it had, it mentioned that it's broad with little action. And what I see happen, uh, it's, it's okay to have these broad objectives that you want to accomplish. So we want to be the leader in early literacy in our community. That's great. But that's not an actionable thing that you can do. You need to break it up into, into projects or think about it like key deliverables. So how are you going to achieve that? So you have that listed as the header on one of your strategic goals. Underneath it, have three to five little uh, smaller projects that when you add it up, you're actually achieving that as, as what you need. So don't stop once you get a really good objective, make sure you break it up and you have those things that will ultimately add up so you can accomplish those. And I think that begs the question of who's doing the work during what process of planning. And so those top level goals that are identified through your community gathering input process, the board needs to be intimately involved in, in helping to identify those and approve them. When you're thinking about how to operationalize them and make them come into being, that's where your staff who you've uh, hired to be your technical experts, our library scientists, if you will, they're going to take what they've learned about the community, what they're hearing uh, as best practices, what they're seeing 
seeing going on in other parts of the country to bring that into your local environment to say, here's some you know, creative or strategic ways to actually achieve this very high level goal that we want to, to do. So I don't think the board needs to be involved at figuring out the, the kind of steps of how we're going to get there as much as having the director and staff lead you towards this is what we see as the way to accomplish this top level goal that the board's identified and then getting some feedback from the board at that point. My heart goes out to any of those boards that approved a plan or adopted a plan December of 2019. I think back to the, I think back to those ALA transform questions that you ask. Think about what the answers to those questions were in 2019 versus what the answers to those questions are right now. If you know those questions are different, they're different. So now's a really good time to start reinvigorating your plan to align with a, pro, a post COVID world. Um, Let's jump into this third question here. Uh, the handbook references different types of plans. Can you discuss the differences between long-term and short-term plans? And how do you how do plans like disaster preparedness and facilities fit into these documents? I think you guys answered a lot of this during the uh, presentation portion of it. So maybe let's focus on the last question there. How do these plans like disaster preparedness and facilities fit into these types of plans? I'll start. <laughs> Um, I think disaster preparedness and facilities specifically have different levels of engagement. So disaster preparedness is something that isn't tied necessarily to time. Um, it's something that may evolve as we understand the risks around us better um, and may need to be you know, reviewed on a, a regular basis. But I think disaster traditional disaster preparedness is talking about natural disasters. Uh, perhaps now we're adding in cybersecurity as we talked about during the risk management session, um, but we're not necessarily tying those to the goals of the plan so much. Whereas your facilities plan, you can think of it in two different tracks. One is the, I think, good stewardship of the building and making sure it's well cared for and, and preventative maintenance happening. Then there's a second layer to your facilities plan that should be tied to your long range or strategic plans where you're utilizing and leveraging your building to help you achieve some of the goals that have been set in that strategic or long range plan. So when Jerry used the example of um, being known or Ron, I'm sorry, I forget which of you mentioned it, being known uh, as the place to go for early literacy support, should there be components of the facility plan that are morphing and evolving aspects of your buildings to be an early literacy center? That may take investment to make that happen if you don't already have a fabulous children's room or um, study areas for families and tutors. So I think there's two ways to think about your facility plan, but it's that second track of the facility plan that's directly tied to the type of planning we're talking about tonight. I guess I'd simply say, don't wait to finish your long range plan to have a disaster preparedness plan in place. There's, a, there's urgency for one and the other is a bit more long range and strategic. So. What steps should we take in the planning process to make sure we have staff buy-in? It seems difficult to set objectives for the library if employees do not get a say in the process of creating a plan. I'll start real simple. I can't imagine you doing this without engaging the staff. I, I the concept that they, you wouldn't have the staff involved in this on many levels is uh, counterproductive. I'll be diplomatic. I was going to say insane, but okay. <laughs> no, no. I was, I was going to say crazy, but that's a little bit right. better, more articulate. I think you should have that cross pollination of having staff on your planning team um, yeah. to help, especially with the assessment, the step two, assessing your library and helping you understand the existing conditions of how folks are using the library to pull those reports on the most popular areas of the collection, trends in program attendance. When do we have to say no to patrons at the front desk? That's the kind of uh, expertise your staff can lend to this process because that's there every day. That's what they're seeing consistently. And then they got to be involved again on that that back end of analysis right once you've gotten all that excellent data not only from the staff but from the community about what they're looking for as we said before those that library scientists we got to put our lab coats on and start to use what we know as professionals to help transform what's just a pie in the sky idea to something that's going to happen in the real world and so i think staff have to be part of that there also needs to be a communication plan probably that goes along with your planning process where staff as a whole are aware the process is happening how, what does it look like? Their points of involvement and opportunities 
to provide feedback, getting ahead of that issue and communicating those types of things to them can save you a lot of heartache at the end if they feel like a plan's been superimposed on them without their input. But I'll just finish quickly by saying the staff does not make the plan. They contribute. It's a community-based process. And the staff, you know, you, you just don't want people talking in an echo chamber and you don't want folks that suffer from the curse of knowledge in, uh, in that they, they're library people talking to each other with their own language and that's the world they live in. So uh, I, uh, I, I must concur that that transforming libraries uh, question process, questioning process is great. And, and that's a way to open it up. But without the, the staff to filter it, to be to contribute, you're you're going to be lost. I think even the most um, brave staff who love change and embrace it and can't wait to do something different the next day, even they have a comfort zone that you eventually can push upon. Um, yeah. So I think that understanding that staff may tend towards doing things they're comfortable doing or they feel really uh, competent at doing, that doesn't mean they can't evolve and think a little differently about how they do their work. But I think left to their own devices, that comfort zone might mean we don't necessarily grow and be as responsive as necessary to changing needs of the community. Yeah. I know I'm going to get some hate mail after this one from library directors and staff for saying that. But has no, to be and Rebecca, a process that, that personally I used in, in redesigning libraries was having the staff go visit other types of public service organizations and corporate organizations uh, to say, what, what do you, in other words, I asked the staff, how, how do you want to, re, this is not for long range planning, but a simple process. How do you want to deal with customer service? We sent them to banks. We sent them to supermarkets. We sent them to go out and learn how the re how other institutions did it within the community, and it informed them greatly. Uh, and that's the kind of outreach that you're suggesting for the whole vision for the library. We've got to get out there and, and see what the bigger picture is, not the library picture. I just add one more thing. I think, and I don't mean to be super blunt about this, but at the end of the day, folks vote on your budget or are you are being kind of held by a trial by fire in front of a municipality about how much money the library is going to get. And I think I always think about the planning process as building the confidence that we can stand in front of voters and say, yes, we do need money. We're doing relevant work. We're doing work that matters. It's not the same old, same old. And we have to do that with authenticity. And this planning process gives you that, which is absolutely priceless. And I think it just paves the way for folks being willing to invest in your library and what you're doing. So I think if staff are super resistant, which can sometimes happen in a planning process, they might need a reality check about where money comes from to make things happen. Um, you can't assume they understand that. They might just think it's the board making decisions. And when you understand that wider ecosystem of who makes decisions about library funding, the level of engagement necessary to do this right should become more clear to them. Rebecca, I'm going to venture into politics. And, and I love what you just said. Go out and ask your enemies what they want in the community, what they should, what they believe in, what their, what their vision is. Uh, because you may learn something along the way. And when you try to do something new, if you can look your enemy in the eye and say, that's an idea that you gave us, you've just won big time. Listen to everyone, uh, even if you don't like what they're saying. So I'm going to pivot right now. I know we had a few more pre-submitted questions, but we're getting flooded with uh, live questions. So I want to make sure we get to these questions that, uh, from folks that are participating here tonight. So I'm just going to jump into it here. Um, the first question comes from Maggie, and she wants to know, should the planning process be driven by our director or by the board, or should it be 50-50? So this ties back to those roles and responsibilities that we learned uh, in earlier installments. Ron, why don't you take this one? Sure, yeah. I think uh, this goes back to kind of a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about already where um, it's not necessarily one or the other and maybe it's not 50-50. It's the board is looking at that kind of larger scale uh, governance, thinking about the future of the library. The director and staff are looking at those uh, actionable goals that you're trying to put together on there. So leading the team um, uh, 
earlier on, Re uh, Rebecca had mentioned having a, some type of planning committee in place, which I think is a fantastic idea and really the best way to get these things done. Um, and having a strong leader or a project manager to make sure that it carries through. Sometimes that's the director, sometimes it's board president, it depends on the ecosystem at the library itself, but everybody needs to be involved in this partnership as you move forward to it. Uh, Rebecca, do you have any specific number breakdown? 50, 50, 25, 75, what do you think? <laughs> I think it sometimes depends on the size of your board and your staff, right? Who, you know, the makeup of that um, can, can vary differently from that. But I definitely think you wanna have representation from leadership um, on your staff. And if you've got a really tiny staff, that might be very clear who it is. Uh, but you also don't want too big of a group um, who won't be able to, I think, function in an efficient way. I don't want the trustees to get the, the idea that they're going to actually do a lot of heavy lifting here. They have to do a lot of heavy thinking and dreaming and articulating the mission. But the grunt work is done by the people that you have entrusted with the library, the director and their staff. So this next, next question comes from an anonymous participant, and they want to know how do you get the community involved, because uh, that seems like a very big, big, important part of what we're trying to do here, if they don't show up to advertised meetings. Why, why are you waiting for them to come to meetings? Go, go out and get them. Go get them. You know, Jerry said, go uh, talk to your enemies, talk to everybody, just go out there, use those transform questions as interviews, uh, give people a call, uh, meet them where they're at. Sorry, Rebecca, I, I walked over what you were about to say. Go for it. I think it's the toughest part of the process is to get people to participate with you, particularly when you reach out to folks that aren't regular library users and be like, why do you want to hear from me? I don't use the library. So I think that when we talk about the lead time or building your timeline for this, I find folks always underestimate how long it will take to get a critical mass of people at a focus group that's specifically for the library. So to Ron's comment about go get them, sometimes we'll ask for time on the agenda of an intact group in town. So maybe there's a 4-H group or there's a Boy Scout troop and we just say, hey, can we get on your agenda? We need about you know, 30, 45 minutes of your time to do this, this process. It might be helpful to you too and you're thinking about what your group's doing or defaulting when you can't get that one key person to show up at one of your focus groups, you can use that ask exercise that we showed earlier one-on-one. -on -one. We call them VIP interviews. So um, I think that idea of, you know, you can invite folks in, it's going to take a lot of effort to get them there, but it's worth a try, but also be flexible in thinking about the one-on-one -on -one interviews or going to intact groups um, to do interviews as well. One of the things that we started doing here within our system, and this was goes along with the same exact idea that Ron's talking about, is that S exercise. One of the recommendations is just taking to the streets, and, you know, getting out there and, and connecting with your community members, whether that be at um, you know farmers markets or you know uh, different types of events within the community on Main Street or side streets or in the park. Um, just really just getting in their faces and asking them those four essential questions. And you'd be surprised at how many people want to share that information with you. And you'll be so appreciative of the fact that you went out there and actually met them where they're at to get that information from them. One of our friends on the, the call here tonight reminded me that most folks aren't used to being asked about their community. Like that's not something they've ever articulated in many cases. So they might need some time to think about it. Um, so when we do the training for our members on this topic, we have folks interview each other and they realize like, oh, that's like an interesting process. I need to give people a little more time to answer those questions. So you're totally capable of facilitating that process yourself, but maybe go through it yourself first as well. Our next what? question. Our next question comes from Ruth, and she wants to know, what is an efficient method or outline for asking the question of how we are doing? And Jerry, I think you talked about that earlier. How, how do we ask that question of how we are doing on a regular basis, basis without making it an, oh, no, here we go again attitude? I did not uh, intend for it to be onerous. The question, the, my point was that it's a kind of being a spontaneous thing. When you people come in the library and if you're the director or trustee, ask them, talk to, your, talk to your neighbors. And if you have somebody who's giving you a hard time, and I'm sure we all do from time to time, say, well, what do you want from the library? How can we do a better job? It's, uh, uh, my comment was it's extremely informal, but it's constantly seeking input as to how the library is doing and 
as you you guys have mentioned before, what do you how, the, how can the library make the community a better place? Um, how you know, how, do, how can the how can the community be a better place? And then you figure out how the library can can help. I don't think it has to be a, a coordinated effort to, to grill people every time they walk in the door or you see them in the supermarket. But by the same token, if any of you the trustees online tonight have gone to the at least the earlier sessions that we've had about your job, you need to be able to talk to people in the supermarket about why you're a trustee and why the library is important and ask them the same questions. Where, do, where are we going in this community? How can the library help? Pretty simple. I like that question better than how are we doing? Because I think that I've seen okay. trustees use, especially on social media, I've seen trustees with an agenda use their circle of friends like on social media or just the folks they talk to and then they're coming in saying well i'm hearing xyz so i think you'll want i think the idea of how is the library contributing to the community or that feedback that you want to get might be a structured question that's given at a board meeting for folks to go out during a defined period of time and come back i think that conversation starter is awesome what jerry was just saying about when you see someone and you want to get their opinion or you think they might not like you and engaging with them on the topic and not being afraid to do so is super important um, but I also think boards should protect against uh, witch hunts uh, for a, a particular program or a staff person that can happen uh, when we're not careful about that evaluation technique. And, you know, the example I used was a mayor of New York before social media. And he'd ask randomly. And he because he did not want to be in an echo chamber. And unfortunately, social media for most folks is an echo chamber. It's all about that intent, right? Like what's driving that person to ask that question. And that group. So. so the next question that we have, and, and it's actually a really good technical question that we've talked about in past sessions is, do meetings or gathering community input, discussing strategies for creating the long range plan, analyzing information, et cetera, fall under open meetings law? your public library, I'd say, yeah, you'd want to err on the side of, you know, being very open and transparent about what you're gathering. I think at the end of the day, you want to report out on your findings anyway. And if someone wants to come watch you make the sausage, go for it. I mean, I think it's, but most people will be bored out of their minds <laughs> to watch you have the conversation. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's anything to hide during the process. I mean, even if you have identified a weakness in your organization, why would you be ashamed of that? You're, you're working to make it better. Rebecca, I agree with you in principle. I, technically, I would question whether they're under the open meetings law if the board is not making any decisions or taking any action. And they, but if you want an open hearing and an open meeting, it's open, broadcasted. You want people to come, you want people to listen, and you want people to know what was said. Uh, there, it's kind of a contradiction of the whole purpose of the meeting, wouldn't you say? I think if you've got more than two trustees on that committee, it's going to fall under open meetings law for a public library, association libraries, so though, do your yeah. thing. Oh, well, sure it is. Yeah. Eight plus to the person that asked that question. They're pulling yeah. that thread all the way through. I like it. Good question. I, yeah. Sure. I thought it was a good question. Uh, the next question comes from Francis. And Rebecca, you and I were actually talking about this earlier today when we talked about uh, libraries in similar communities or the same community. Should a library, to an extent possible, align its plan with that or those of the neighboring library or libraries? I think it depends on your service population, right? You've got a distinct service population. And while you might be geographically close, if you're in a very dense area, the needs could still be very different. We all know those lines in certain areas of our regions where you, know, you just go two streets over and the socioeconomic makeup or demographics are completely different. So I don't think there's a blanket answer for that one. If you see similarities or um, you share certain populations, God forbid you have overlaps in your service area, which we all know is out there. Uh, maybe there's some coordination necessary, but I don't think it's a given. It's not bad to know what their plans are, though. Yeah, I was going to say, it's always good to take a look at your surrounding library plans mm -hmm. to see what they're focusing on. Not to copy them, maybe, but just to know what else is going on there, because there are some instances that there may be some overlap or that you can complement in some other way, too. And a little competition doesn't hurt. There you go.
you didn't lose me guys sorry <laughs> i'm right here with, i'm right here with you sorry there's just a lot of questions going on all at one time it's great yeah. um so i'm going to jump back to the pre-submitted questions because they're uh, they relate to some of the other questions that were uh just submitted just now what is the right size plan or how many goals should be created it seems like if we create too many goals then everyone will get overwhelmed but if we create too few goals we'll miss out on an opportunity to serve the community or we did a lot of planning work for a little bit of output. So like, what's the balance? This one easy. Well, I think themes emerge during your process. Like at first you'll feel like you're hearing just hundreds of things hitting your brain. And then all of a sudden the patterns start to emerge and you realize there's really only maybe three or four tropes like going through everything you're hearing. So at the end of the day, I think you, you end up with maybe three, maybe three to five, let's say goals at that top level of your long range plan. And then as uh, Ron was talking about of how do you actually get those top level goals down, done, you might have three to five goals or objectives underneath those goals um, that you will then create action items for. So I agree, I think, you could have too few or too, too many, but also you're going to realize once you start hearing what people have to say, those themes, they fall into categories relatively quickly. And it's how you kind of know you're done with your information gathering process, actually, because you keep, you start hearing the same things over and over again. Which what Rebecca you said. Oh, God, you're on. You go. You're up. I, as Rebecca was saying, uh, you know, I, I love to have this is a great opportunity to re-engage the board and everything, too. So you have that visioning portion of it where you talked in the beginning, you gathered all the input. Um, this one, what I love to go in and facilitate this portion of it because it's like a post-it note activity. and You can actually visually see what Rebecca is talking about, where things start to theme together and they start to build off each other. And you can see where hey, there's this little straggler over here. Maybe we focus on this next year or something like that. These are the core areas that we're looking at. So actually being able to see it come together is a really cool thing. And it helps the board feel even more empowered as well as staff and everybody else understand what you're trying to do with this plan. I'll just share that on the first time we used the turning outwards process in our system, I think we had 10 libraries, eight or 10 libraries do it with us the first time through. And when they brought back their community data, and we went through the theming exercise and we had big, this is pre-pandemic, we had big post-it note, like flip chart size post-it notes on the walls where each team wrote the themes that emerged. And my colleague Kirsten and I were running around our auditorium, reading them all really quickly. And I, I feel like I'm giving away the end of the story here, but like they were all almost identical, even though there are eight distinct separate communities, those themes, they, they really do trend together pretty easily. So the job is actually not as tough as you might think at that point. I would also just add on that each year when you go through your plan and you reevaluate it and you want to establish those short-term objectives for the year in which, upon which you're going to judge the, the performance of your director, perhaps, um, don't have too many. You know, pick the ones that are doable, do the easy ones first. Um, but it is important that you, uh, again, we're getting back to personnel issues here, but it, you cannot not expect your, your chief executive officer to accomplish your long range plan in a year. If you know, you, you're going to have to give some reasonable goals and then you can evaluate and again, evaluate how you as a board are doing. So I think that that is part of another process of evaluation, um, but an important one, and you can fold this planning process together with your evaluation process of yourself and your director rather easily. Jerry, you mentioned something we talked about in uh, previous sessions on the director's evaluation. And I think this is a great place to tie uh, upcoming director objectives for the year back to the plan of service. Mm -hmm. You know, why create additional objectives or goals for a director when you have a good working community focused plan in place? So, you know, making sure the director is responsible for carrying out the goals and objectives within that plan. And you know, tying the director's annual goals and objectives as part of their evaluation process to the plan is a great way of not only just being efficient, but also making sure that that plan of service or that strategic plan is being carried out um, that was approved by the board of trustees. So the, yeah. next, oh, so the next question I have comes from Santa. And the question is, our, our strategy expires at the end of this year. Since the library is going through a lot of transitions, we haven't been able to look at the strategy and not sure we will be able to. Can we extend the strategy one year, 
would the would the board have to vote on extending if we can't? We do that all the time, you know, in the, the pandemic, as Brian was saying, like some folks passed their plan maybe a year or two before the pandemic, and then we're in the pandemic, there's no way we were getting planning done in that environment in many cases. So we just had the board strategically extend the plan. They tweaked it sometimes a little bit based on what they were learning through the pandemic, but it's your plan, right? So I think you can do with it what you need to do to be effective, but I would suggest a board vote. So we all agree we're doing that and we're on the same page about it. And the director has a fighting chance to understand what you'd like them to accomplish in the coming 12 months. Santa's in my system. So give me a call, Santa. We'll figure it out. Santa. Excellent. So the next question is um, from Christian. How do you get the trustees and or your town city village to think outside the library box? So I'm assuming this is relative to uh, some type of planning and then also maybe a municipal public library. I'm going to defer to you folks with your transforming libraries. I thought that was a great way to get to get there. And that's why we like that process is just to people have a lot of assumptions about what libraries are and do. And they're usually about 50 years behind what's actually going on if they haven't been to a library in a while. So that's why we like to ask exercise from libraries transform communities because we're, we're turning literally outwards and asking people to think about themselves and the community and what's necessary. And then I do think there's probably going to be some education for folks when you come back with the results of what you've done. As Ron said, you need to publicize the outcomes that you produce through that planning process, explaining to people the role of a modern library. Um, when people just think we're warehouses of books, or maybe we do some early literacy work, you're really understanding the true nature of being an education institution devoted to lifelong learning in your community that's going to look very different than it did in 1965. Um, so there's definitely going to be an education component at the other end. But again, they're not the ones ideating with you. They are the ones telling you what they are experts in, which is living in town or the challenges facing that town. Next question. How do trustees make sure the goals approved by the board and created by the director or staff are carried out? Should we be asking for monthly or annual reports? And what if they aren't providing the data that was established as evaluation criteria? It seems like any reporting should be objectively, it seems like any reporting should objectively show goals are being reached. Well, I guess I'd have to ask, did you do the step in between long range planning and reporting? Did you actually think about the gap analysis between what you're capable of doing and what you need to have capacity for to achieve those goals? Uh, because I think just doing the top level goals and then saying, make it so, you've just let go of a huge amount of responsibility to actually take a look at the library's finances, staffing levels, facility capacity, uh, and overall budget to make sure you can actually have the capacity to achieve those things. So I think once it's broken down into those finer operational steps, that's much easier for the director or the board committees working in those areas to be reporting back on a regular basis. Did I answer that whole question, Brian? I feel like I forgot the last half of it. <laughs> no, I, I think you I think you got it. And you guys talked about it through the slides as well. But uh, Ron or Jerry, do you have additional input? I think if a board, if a board does not feel they're getting sufficient information, they need to ask for it. And if the director can't supply it, the director needs to say why. I mean, it's 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 a normal relationship. And um, if you don't like the answer, that's another that's another question altogether. I think it, it to for the directors on the line is to be empowered to admit like that that's great. We have this plan, and, and, and on the outside, I thought we could totally do it, but now that we're in it. Now that I'm like neck deep in it, I see we, our staff actually doesn't have the training to do this type of program. And we're going to have to readjust this timeline. I need to get them some training on this thing. We're going to uh, re uh, we're going to move that line of, of what it looks like to be successful and, and by on what timeline. So I think being just really frank and honest with the board about the just practical nature of getting stuff done in an organization, there needs to be investment sometimes not only of cash, but education or rethinking some things that have been in place for a very long time. So sometimes once you get into it, you can't predict how long it's going to take. So I think for boards to give directors the license 
for trial and error, to iterate on ideas, to come back with a new operational plan for how to get something done as they learn along the way um, is really how some really exciting stuff can happen in a library. And you know, they think it, um, please run. Go ahead. The same thing's true for the evaluation portion of it too. Once you're neck deep in it, the initial way that you're going to evaluate this program may not it may not make sense anymore. So figuring out a new way to do it, and you you every time you learn something new, and you'll be able to do that next portion of the plan better, or your next rendition of the plan. So use this as kind of lessons learned, and then build on it for your future plans that you're putting together. Drilling down a little bit on, on this is a great topic because it gets into personnel management and the board should only be managing one personnel. Um, and it, it's not a question of, oh, we can't meet the goal. It's a question of, were you able to accomplish the, the activities that we have established that would meet this short term objective? And if you if you were able to do every single thing you set out to do, well, you have bigger jobs to do in this world. Um, and, and if your director does not feel comfortable saying it didn't work out, or even I failed, nobody wants to say that, but that's their job to say everyone did a good job and it didn't work, I didn't do this or that. Either. If they're not comfortable sharing failure with you, there's a lack of communication and trust. And you need to work on that as well. I don't think I ever did a, uh, an, a, an annual report to my board. And we, we went through this for 15 years in a cycle where I didn't have to tell them, well, we had this project and it really didn't work. Um, and we tried something else. And if you can't, if you don't have that level of honesty, there's another problem that you need to work on. But every activity is not going to work. It's just not, you know, there might be a, another way to do it. And, and, and so that needs to be reevaluated. But those ultimate goals, those dreams you have, that vision, that's something that you should still be working toward. The activities, some are going to fail. Absolutely. So fast failures are a very good thing to do in business. Fast failures, not long-term failures. You need to be able to admit failure. I remember one year at Nyla did a program called Fail Faster. And just like oh, admit yeah. it's not working and move on. Like, what can you learn from the experience? Retain some yeah. of that good stuff, but let go and move on. <laughs> yeah. I like this question and I don't want to make any assumptions about where it comes from, but it really kind of underlines just the importance of strategic planning or planning all by itself is, you know, early on when we started this program, I said it allows us that opportunity to be innovative and creative. You can't be innovative and creative without making lots of mistakes and having failures. And, you know, you have to allow your plans to have that level of flow and, and you know, to experiment and make mistakes and, and, you know, do things that you wouldn't traditionally do based on community feedback. Um, the other thing that I like about it that it really underscores is what Jerry talked about earlier in his days as working as a system director. You know, the state required systems to create this plan so that we check a box and, you know, they filled in the blanks and, but it was put on a shelf and it was never engaged with. And so that's the other place where this uh, question really comes from is just that holistic approach of constantly being engaged with the plan. And that's what you guys are talking about is just being there in the moment and understanding that everybody's working on it and they're working for that vision that was set in the beginning, but also things are getting done. Um, I'm not sure if there's any personnel issues or anything like that, like that, that are going on with it. But the fact that, you know, they're being experimental, they're being creative, they're being innovative, sure mistakes and failures are being made along the way, but they're continually engaging with that plan as they go through that process. So really good stuff. Um, Let's get to, we've got a little bit more time on our hands and I got a couple more questions here. I wanna make sure that we get to. Uh, Shandy submits this question and I really like this question. And I think it's an important question that we answer here tonight. If you are in a minority majority community, how do you plan for change beginning with the board? One step at a time, right? Acknowledging that's an issue and figuring out those steps forward. I think there's more and more resources out there to help do that work. Um, but until you acknowledge it and put a plan forward to do it, um, nothing's going to change. So I think there's lots of resources out there um, related to that particular topic today um, that should help um, with that work. I don't know if this board is a, an elected board or an appointed board, 
but libraries that I've worked with in, uh, in that circumstance that understand that the future of their library is tied to the future of their community, aggressively work to engage all their communities at the highest level of the library and at every level of the library, meaning from trustees to part-time clerks. And it's, it's a it, bottom line, it, it's a policy. It's an approach to service because again, if you want your library to be successful, you need to serve the people of your community and you need to reflect the people of your community. And that's just good business. It's that simple. And um, so many, many of the communities, you know, where, where I live and have worked have been communities in transition or have been under, had a lot of underserved populations. And it really helps the library to engage more and more people, but it's work. And it's work that's not done by flyers or advertising or newsletters. It's work done one-to-one, -one, person to person, telling people we need your help. We need your involvement. We need to know what we can do for you. And providing it. Don't just talk it, do it. I just put in the chat box some of those resources that I kind of generally referenced there before about board diversity, um, but obviously a hot topic these days and something that needs deliberate action. It doesn't just happen by chance and you can influence this for elected boards. I think that's a cop out when folks say, oh, well, they didn't, no one ran. Oh yes, you um, can. Sure you got to cultivate and reach out and help people see themselves reflected in your organization, whether it be on the board or the staff. And there are communities in, in this state, very what we you would consider classically wealthy communities that have that I've worked with that have made this their objective and they've been extremely successful and and for the better for everyone in the community, especially the library. All right. So one of our final questions we're going to ask uh, stems from a question that Charlotte asked in the in the question. And uh, answer section, uh, but a few other trustees asked this question. And so they would like it if uh, any three of you could kind of expand on how you include facilities and building within your strategic planning, um, just because uh, they need help in either near-term or long-term building issues. So how does that get included in the plan? I'd start with acknowledge that you need it, uh, articulate what your vision is, and but it's not, the details are not part of your strategic plan. The, the, the need for it, the vision for it can certainly be part of it, but you really need to separate that moving forward. In other words, have, have your buildings and grounds committee be, be given the, the, the orders, the marching orders to move forward with, um, you know, facility evalu evaluation, um, using the, the input from the community that you're asking them about how to design the library. Remember, your, your, new, your library has to be draped over your service program and your service program has to reflect what your community wants. So it's, don't get the, cart bef the, the horse before the cart, the cart before the horse, I'm sorry. The, you, you need to go through this planning thoroughly before you can start dreaming about that new building. Um, but meanwhile, you might need a new HVAC system. Uh, which is something that you're going to have to address in a much shorter term. So I, I think it's all of one piece, but don't get, it's your, your strategic and long range planning is not about getting a new building. That might be a byproduct of it. it indeed, uh, many libraries, again, uh, have gone through this process where they've decided that we're an association library or a municipal library. We're being starved by the community. It's time for us to find better financial and legal stability. That's a that's another project, and there are there's a lot of tools out there to help you. Trust me, because Rebecca and I just finished an, a, a new project for the state to to give you guidance on that. But there's those are big issues, but they're part of the plan. They're not the plan. 
I think a really smart way to do it is to acknowledge that in your process, if you keep hitting up against, well, we'd love to do that, but we don't have the space. So we'd love to do that, but our building's not accessible. Then one of the objectives needs to be a new master plan facility plan for the library. Um, that needs to be part of your plan. So the plan itself doesn't need to be embedded in there, but the acknowledgement that you've hit up against this as a problem, and then you'll engage in a different planning process to create that mm -hmm. larger facility yeah. plan to truly meet the needs of the community. And by the way, if you engage your community in this initial plan, and then you start a building plan, plan or a process to change your legal structure, you're simply doing what the community told you to do. And that ask exercise, the last question, what needs to change? I can't tell you how often people say, well, if only we had a library that was big enough to do X, Y, Z. And you're like, oh, really? Okay, write that down. And then later, you know, six months later, you're like, well, based on what we heard from the community, we're now engaging in this facility process. Exactly. So the last question, so Rebecca just mentioned the uh, ask exercise through ALA transforms. The last question I want to uh, leave us with for tonight, because, you know, this is a really great method methodology. It's, it's something that all of our systems have participated in and use with, with our local library. So the last question is, our board would like to use the ALA transform ask exercise. However, some members on the board do not feel questions about how people perceive the community or community visioning tied back to the library. Any advice on how we convince how we can convince other trustees this method does provide useful information to the library? We've seen other libraries in our system use it. I'd love to invite Casey to, to pop online right now. I know he usually is behind the scenes, but he does an awesome job in our system leading uh, really some very large cohorts of libraries through this process. And I just want to invite him to share his take on this one. Um, so we're at the end of the webinar here, but uh, a lot of the things that Ron and Rebecca have said about the process are true. So I would share definitely this recording with them. That'll make a really good case for why you should do this. Um, definitely, you're going to get a lot of really good information. We're here to serve the whole community, and we can't really get information about what the community is looking for by asking about the library specifically. Um, if you use those hardwood tools, as we do here at Mid-Hudson, when we do our strategic planning with our libraries, you're also going to have a lot of other side effects, too. Uh, as we mentioned too, there's going to be a shift in your mindset, right? The whole thing, we're turning outward. We're not thinking about what we're looking at day to day. Some of our staff is stuck in their offices, doing their work in there, whether they're working from home or anything like that. But we're going, to start, we're going to start focusing on the community again there. And so it is a different shift than what we might be useful, uh, used to. The other thing is there's a lot of side effects with the people that we reach out to. So we can target specific groups. Ron said, go to where they are. We actually build lists of people that we want to talk to, and then we establish personal connections. Do you know this person at Rotary? Do you know this person at the fire department? And so you go and you talk to these folks. And instead of saying, hey, can you tell me about the library? You say, hey, can you tell me about what kind of community do you want to live in? And that's a much different place to start from. And you build a lot of goodwill. And as Rebecca said, we have seen a lot of libraries get a lot of goodwill from this program and a lot of attention from school boards and town boards who say, oh my goodness, look at this thing that the library did. We need more of this. The last thing that you do as part of the turning hour process, when you're making your strategic plan, you're also writing a report to the community about all the things that you heard in those conversations and using the ask exercise. It's not supposed to be a secret. It's information that all the groups and all the people in the community need to help your community move forward and realize those aspirations that they want to see. So it took us over time, but thank you for a minute. <laughs> Casey, I think your experience is invaluable. You've helped lead uh, at this point more than 20 libraries through the process. We know it works. Um, so your firsthand information is super valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. So I know we had Casey go last, but I also feel like it's a really great way to end our session because it's something that is going to sit with us and it's the last thing that we're going to remember coming out of tonight's session. So I want to thank Ron, Rebecca, Jerry, Casey for joining us this evening. I want to thank all of you as trustees across the New York State Library community for joining us. Uh, please make sure to register for our June 14th event. Ron Kersop is going to be moderating that one. Um, and all these resources are available on the Mid-Hudson Library System website at midhudson.org forward slash trustee book club. On behalf of our entire team, which are the people you're looking at on the screen right now, thank you so much for all the work that you do. Uh, we get paid to do this work. You guys do it for free. And it's just so exciting to work with amazing people all across the state that are truly changing the lives and having true community impacts uh, with the folks and community members that we serve. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.